Metamorphosis. Book by Franz Kafka. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1915. This is a great audiobook production created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 3. The grievous wound Gregor had received, which plagued him for over a month, the apple remained lodged there in his flesh, a visible memento. Since no one dared to remove it, seemed to have reminded even his father that Gregor, despite his current lamentable, repulsive form, was a member of the family who should not be treated like an enemy, for family duty dictated that the others swallow down the disgust he aroused in them and show him tolerance, only tolerance. And even though this wound cost Gregor some of his mobility, probably for good, and for the time being he required many, many minutes to hobble across his room like an old invalid, crawling up the walls was out of the question now. He was compensated for this worsening of his condition by what seemed to him a perfectly adequate substitute. As evening approached, the door to the living room, on which he would start keeping a sharp eye an hour or two beforehand, would always be open so as to permit him. Lying in his own dark room and invisible from the living room, to watch the entire family sitting at the brightly lit table and listen to their conversations now, as it were, in an officially sanctioned capacity and thus quite differently than before. To be sure, these were no longer the animated conversations of earlier times that Gregor used to think back on with a certain longing from various cramped hotel rooms when it was time to throw himself, exhausted, into the damp bedding. Now everything was fairly quiet. Gregor's father would fall asleep in his armchair soon after supper. His mother and sister would admonish one another to silence. His mother, bent far over beneath the light, would be sewing ladies under things for a dress shop. His sister, who had taken a job as a salesgirl, was studying stenography and French in the evenings so as possibly to move to a better position later on. Sometimes Gregor's father would wake up and, as if unaware he had been sleeping, would say to Gregor's mother, how long you've been sewing again today, and then go right back to sleep, which would prompt Gregor's mother and sister to exchange weary smiles. In a peculiar form of stubbornness, Gregor's father refused to take off his porter's uniform even at home. And while his nightshirt hung uselessly on its hook, he would slumber where he sat, fully clothed. As though he remained ready for service at all times and even here was awaiting his supervisor's call. As a result, his uniform, which had not been new to start with, soon forfeited much of its cleanliness, despite the care lavished on it by mother and sister. And Gregor would sometimes gaze for an entire evening at this stain-covered jacket resplendent with gold buttons, always highly polished, in which the old man slept in considerable discomfort but nonetheless soundly. The moment the clock struck ten, Gregor's mother would attempt to rouse his father with a few hushed words and then persuade him to go to bed, for he would get no proper sleep sitting here. And sleep was something Gregor's father, who had to report for duty at six in the morning, desperately needed. But in keeping with the stubbornness that had taken hold of him when he started working as a porter, he always insisted on continuing to sit there at the table, even though he kept falling asleep. And then it was only with the greatest effort that he could be persuaded to exchange armchair for bed. Gregor's mother and sister could persist in their little admonishments as doggedly as they liked. For a quarter of an hour, he would just shake his head slowly his eyes closed, without getting up. Gregor's mother would pluck at his sleeve, whispering cajoling words in his ear, and his sister would set aside her studies to come to her mother's aid, but to no avail. Gregor's father only settled deeper into his armchair. Only when the women gripped him beneath the arms would he open his eyes, looking by turns at mother and sister and saying, What sort of life is this? Is this the peace and quiet of my old age? Then, supported by the two women, he would rise, laboriously, as though he himself were receiving the brunt of this burden, and allow the women to escort him to the doorway, where he would shoo them away and continue on his own. While Gregor's mother hastily threw down her sewing and his sister her pin, so they could run after him to offer further assistance. The household was ever further reduced, the maid was now let go after all. A bony giant of a charwoman with white hair flapping about her head came by in the morning and evening to perform the heaviest labors. Everything else was handled by Gregor's mother along with all her sewing. It even came to pass that several pieces of jewelry that had been in the family, jewels Gregor's mother and sister had delighted in wearing at entertainments and festivities, were sold. 
as Gregor would learn in the evening when the price each piece had brought would be discussed. But their greatest lament was always that they were unable to leave this apartment, which was far too large for their current circumstances, since no one could imagine how Gregor might be moved. But Gregor understood that it was not only out of consideration for him that a move was being ruled out. Since he could easily enough have been transported in a crate of appropriate size with a few air holes. The main thing keeping the family from moving to a new apartment was their complete sense of hopelessness and the thought that they had been struck with a misfortune such as no one else in their entire circle of relations and friends had ever experienced. They were fulfilling to the utmost the demands the world makes on the poor. Gregor's father fetched breakfast for the petty employees at the bank, his mother sacrificed herself for the underclothes of strangers. His sister ran back and forth behind the shop counter at her customer's behest, but this was all the strength they had. And the wound in Gregor's back would begin to ache anew when mother and sister, having brought his father to bed, would now return and, leaving their work where it lay, huddle close beside one another pressing their cheeks together, when Gregor's mother, gesturing toward his room, would say, Shut the door now, Greta. And when Gregor was left in the dark again while next door the two women intermingled their tears or else sat there tearless, staring down at the table. Gregor spent his nights and days almost entirely without sleeping. Sometimes he thought about taking the family's affairs in hand again, just as he used to, the next time his door was opened. Once more his boss and the general manager would appear before his mind's eye after all this time, the clerks and apprentices, the dull-witted hired man, two or three friends from other firms. A chambermaid from a provincial hotel, a sweet, fleeting specter, the shop girl from a haberdashery whom he had courted earnestly but too slowly, all of these now appeared to him. Interspersed with strangers or people already forgotten, but instead of coming to his aid and that of his family, every last one of them was unapproachable and he was glad when they disappeared. At other times he would be not at all in a frame of mind to look after his family. Instead he was filled with rage at how poorly he was attended to and although he could not imagine anything he would have liked to eat. He plotted how he might gain access to the pantry so as to help himself to what, despite his total absence of hunger, was his due. Without bothering to consider how she might give Gregor particular pleasure, his sister would quickly thrust some randomly chosen foodstuff into his room with her foot on her way to work in the morning or at midday, only to sweep it out again at night with a quick swipe of the broom paying no heed if the food had been only barely nibbled at or, as was most often the case now, not touched at all. Setting Gregor's room to rights, a task she now saved for the evenings, could not possibly have been done any more perfunctorily. Great streaks of dirt extended across the walls, with balls of dust and rubbish lying scattered about. At first, when Gregor's sister came into his room, he would position himself in corners particularly indicative of this problem, to reproach her, as it were by his presence there. But he could just as well have spent entire weeks sitting there without any improvement on his sister's part. After all, she saw the dirt as plainly as he did, but had made up her mind to leave it be. At the same time, with a sensitivity that was new in her, one that had now taken hold of the family as a whole. She was on her guard to make sure the task of tidying Gregor's room was reserved for her. Once Gregor's mother had subjected his room to a thorough scrubbing, which she accomplished only after using up several buckets of water, admittedly, all this moisture was itself an affront to Gregor, who lay stretched out, bitter and immobile, upon the settee, but his mother did not escape punishment. For no sooner had his sister remarked the change in Gregor's room that evening than she ran into the living room, grievously insulted, and ignoring her mother's imploringly raised hands. Set to weeping so violently that her parents, naturally her father was startled out of his chair, at first stood by helpless and astonished, until they too began to stir. On the right, Gregor's father reproached his mother for not having left the cleaning of Gregor's room to his sister. While on the left he shouted at Gregor's sister, threatening that she would never again be permitted to clean Gregor's room. While his mother attempted to drag his father, now so agitated he hardly recognized himself, into the bedroom, Gregor's sister, shaking with sobs, pummeled the table with her tiny fists. And Gregor hissed loudly in fury because it had occurred to no one to shut the door of his room to spare him this sight and commotion. But even if Gregor's sister, who was exhausted by her professional work, had wearied of caring for Gregor as she'd previously done, 
there was absolutely no need for his mother to fill her shoes. And Gregor needn't have suffered neglect. For now the charwoman was here. This old widow, who had seen and survived the worst in her long life with the help of her sturdy bones, felt no particular repugnance toward Gregor. Without being at all inquisitive, she had once chanced to open the door to his room and, seeing Gregor, who had begun to run back and forth although no one was chasing him. She stood there staring in astonishment, her hands clasped across her lap. Ever since, she never failed to open the door a crack for a moment every morning and evening to look in on him. At the beginning she would call him over to her, saying things that were probably intended to sound friendly, like, hey, over here. You old dung beetle, or just look at the old dung beetle. Thus addressed, Gregor gave no reply but instead remained where he was, immobile, as if the door had never been opened. If only this charwoman, instead of being allowed to disturb him uselessly at whim, had been given instructions to clean his room daily. Once, early in the morning, a heavy rain, perhaps already a portent of the coming spring, was beating against the window panes. Gregor became so infuriated when the charwoman started up again with her quips that he turned on her as if to attack, if admittedly slowly and decrepitly. But instead of being frightened, the charwoman just picked up a chair that was standing beside the door and held it high in the air. And as she stood there, her mouth gaping wide, her intention was clear, not to close her mouth again until the chair in her hand had come crashing down upon Gregor's back. Aha, uh -huh, so that's as far as it goes? She asked as Gregor turned around again, and she placed the chair calmly back in its corner. Gregor now ate almost nothing at all. Only if he happened by chance to wander past the food that had been prepared for him might he playfully take a bite of something into his mouth, where he would hold it for hours and then usually spit it out again later. At first he thought it was his sorrow at the state of his room that prevented him from eating, but in fact he had resigned himself very quickly to the changes there. Everyone had gotten into the habit of using his room to store things there was no space for in other parts of the apartment, and now there were many such things. Since one room of the apartment had been rented out to three lodgers. These solemn gentlemen, all three of them were bearded, as Gregor once noted, peering through the crack of the door, were scrupulously intent on having everything tidy. Not just in their room but also, since they were now paying rent here, in the entire household, particularly the kitchen. They could not bear the presence of unnecessary, much less dirty items. Moreover, they had brought most of their own furnishings with them. For this reason, many things had become superfluous, things that could not be sold but were still too valuable to throw out. All of this found its way into Gregor's room. As did the ash box and the garbage pail from the kitchen. The charwoman, always in a great hurry, would simply fling any unserviceable item into Gregor's room. Mercifully, Gregor generally saw only the object in question and the hand that held it. The charwoman may have intended at some point, when she had occasion or a free minute, to come collect these things, or else throw all of them out at once. But as it was they remained wherever they first landed, except when Gregor made his way through the refuse, stirring it around, at first out of necessity. Since there was no room left for him to crawl about, but later with ever-increasing pleasure, though after these wanderings, which left him mortally exhausted and sad. He would spend hours without moving. Since the lodgers sometimes also took their supper at home in the shared living room, the living room door remained shut on some evenings, but Gregor was happy to forego having the door open. In fact, even when it was open, he sometimes failed to take advantage of it and instead, unbeknownst to his family, would remain lying in the darkest corner of his room. Once, however, the charwoman had left the door to the living room slightly ajar, and a jar it remained even when the lodgers came in that evening and struck a light. They sat down at the head of the table where in earlier times Gregor had sat with his father and mother, unfolded the napkins and took up their knives and forks. At once Gregor's mother appeared in the doorway with a serving dish filled with meat, and right behind her came his sister bearing a plate piled high with potatoes. A heavy vapor rose from the steaming food. The lodgers bent over the dishes that had been placed before them, as though wishing to inspect them before beginning their meal. And in fact the one who sat in the middle and appeared to be an authority figure to the other two cut off a piece of meat right there on the platter to check whether it was tender enough and didn't. Have to be sent back to the kitchen. He was satisfied, and Gregor's mother and sister, who had been watching nervously, now smiled with relief. The family members themselves ate in the kitchen, 
Nonetheless, Gregor's father visited the living room on his way to the kitchen and with a single bow, cap in hand, took a tour around the table. The lodgers all rose from their seats and mumbled into their beards. Left alone again, they ate in almost perfect silence. It struck Gregor as peculiar that amid all the various sounds of this meal, one could also make out their champing teeth. As if to demonstrate to Gregor that a person needs teeth to eat, and that even the most splendid jaws, if toothless, can accomplish nothing at all. I'm hungry, Gregor said sorrowfully to himself, but not for these things. Just look how these lodgers take their nourishment while I am wasting away. On this very evening, Gregor couldn't remember having heard the violin once in all this time. The sound of it was heard coming from the kitchen. The lodgers had already finished their evening meal. The one in the middle had pulled out a newspaper, giving each of the others a page, and now the three of them were reading, leaning back in their chairs and smoking. When the violin began to play, their interest was piqued. They got up from their chairs and tiptoed over to the doorway leading to the vestibule, where they stood in a tight cluster. The sounds of this activity must have traveled to the kitchen, for Gregor's father now called out. Are the gentlemen disturbed by this playing? It can be silenced at once. On the contrary, said the one in the middle, would the young lady care to join us and play here in the living room? Where it is much more comfortable and pleasant. Why, of course, Gregor's father exclaimed, as though he were the violinist. The gentleman went back into the room and waited. Soon Gregor's father arrived with the music stand, his mother with the sheet music and his sister with the violin. His sister calmly prepared to play. His parents, who never rented out rooms in earlier days and therefore were treating these lodgers with exaggerated deference, did not even dare to sit in their own armchairs. His father leaned against the door, his right hand tucked between two buttons of his closed livery jacket. His mother, meanwhile, was offered an armchair by one of the lodgers, and since she left the chair where he had happened to place it, she sat off to one side in a corner. Gregor's sister began to play, on either side, his father and mother attentively followed each movement of her hands. Attracted by her playing, Gregor had ventured a bit further than usual and was already sticking his head into the living room. It scarcely surprised him that he had become so inconsiderate of the others. Earlier on, his considerateness had been a source of pride. And he had all the more reason to keep himself hidden away now, thanks to the dust that lay everywhere in his room and would swirl up at the slightest motion, he too was covered in dust. He dragged around threads, hair and food scraps clinging to his back and sides. His general indifference was far too great now for him to keep up with a habit he'd once practiced several times a day, flipping over so as to scrub his back against the rug. And despite his condition, he did not hesitate now to continue his advance a little way out onto the immaculate floor of the living room. To be sure, no one paid him the slightest heed. The family was completely absorbed in the violin playing. The lodgers, on the other hand, having at first positioned themselves, hands in their trouser pockets, much too close behind his sister's music stand, so that they could all look at the sheet music, which surely must have distracted her, soon withdrew to the window, conversing in an undertone, and remained there, anxiously observed by Gregor's father. It appeared more than clear they had been disappointed in their expectation of hearing beautiful or entertaining violin music and now, tired of the whole performance. We're continuing to tolerate this disturbance of their peace only out of politeness. Particularly the way in which all of them were blowing the smoke of their cigars high into the air from their noses and mouths suggested extreme agitation. And yet his sister's playing was so lovely. Her face was tilted to one side. Searchingly, sadly, her eyes followed the lines of notes. Gregor crept a bit farther forward and ducked his head down close to the floor so as perhaps to catch her eye. Was he a beast? That music so moved him? He felt as if he were being shown the way to that unknown nourishment he craved. He was determined to creep all the way up to his sister, to pluck at her skirt, and in this way indicate to her that she should come to his room with her violin. For no one here was rewarding her playing as he meant to reward her. He would not allow her to leave his room ever again, at least as long as he was alive, his horrific figure would, for the first time ever, be useful to him. He would be at all the doors of his room at once growling at his attackers, but his sister should remain with him not by force but of her own free will. She should sit beside him on the settee, bend down, the better to hear. And he would confess to her that he'd had the firm intention of sending her to the conservatory and that if the disaster had not disrupted his plans, 
He would have made a general announcement last Christmas. Christmas had passed now, hadn't it? Without letting himself be swayed by objections of any sort. After this declaration, his sister would be moved to the point of tears, and Gregor would raise himself to the height of her armpit and kiss her throat, which, now that she went to the office every day, she wore free of ribbon or collar. Her Samsa, the gentleman in the middle, shouted at Gregor's father, and without wasting a single word, pointed his finger at Gregor, who was slowly advancing. The violin fell silent. The middle lodger at first just smiled and shook his head, turning toward his friends, then looked again at Gregor. Gregor's father apparently found the task of driving Gregor back into his room less urgent than that of calming the lodgers. Despite the fact that they did not appear particularly worked up and seemed to be finding Gregor more entertaining than the music, he hurried over to them and tried with outspread arms to herd them back into their room, at the same time using his body to shield Gregor from their view. And now they did in fact become a little angry. Though it was no longer clear whether this was on account of Gregor's father's behavior or the realization dawning on them that without their knowledge they had been sharing their home with a roommate of this sort. They demanded explanations of Gregor's father. Now it was their turn to throw their arms into the air. They plucked uneasily at their beards and only slowly withdrew in the direction of their room. Meanwhile, Gregor's sister, who had been standing there at a loss since her playing had been so unexpectedly interrupted, she still held violin and bow in her carelessly dangling hands. Looking over at the notes as though she were continuing to play, all at once pulled herself together, laid her instrument in the lap of her mother, who still sat there in her armchair. Her lungs heaving as she fought for breath, and ran into the next room, toward which the lodgers were now moving somewhat more quickly as Gregor's father urged them on. One saw how, beneath his sister's practiced hands, the bed's blankets and pillows flew into the air and into orderliness. Even before the lodgers reached the room, she had finished making up the beds and slipped out. Gregor's father appeared to be once more so firmly in the grip of his own stubbornness that he forgot the basic respect that, after all, he owed his tenants. He kept up his pressing and urging until, already standing in the doorway, the middle lodger thunderously stamped his foot causing Gregor's father to stop short. I hereby declare, he said, raising his hand and seeking out Gregor's mother and sister too as he glanced about, that in consideration of the reprehensible circumstances prevailing in this apartment and family, and here he spat on the floor without forethought, I give notice on my room effective. Immediately, it goes without saying that I will not pay a penny for the days I have spent here. On the contrary, I shall consider whether or not to pursue you with, Please believe me, easily justifiable claims. He fell silent and went on looking straight before him expectantly. And indeed his two friends at once chimed in with the words, We too give notice effective immediately. Hereupon he seized the door handle and with a great crash slammed the door. Gregor's father staggered to his armchair with groping hands and let himself fall into it. It looked as though he was stretching out for his customary evening nap but the violent nodding of his anchorless head showed that he was absolutely not sleeping. Gregor had gone on lying quietly on the spot where the lodgers had espied him. His disappointment at the failure of his plan and perhaps also the weakness caused by starvation rendered him incapable of moving. With a certain definitiveness he sensed, terrified, that everything was about to collapse all around him, and so he waited. Not even the violin startled him when it fell from his mother's lap beneath her trembling fingers giving off a note that echoed in the air. Dear parents, his sister said, striking the table by way of preamble, things cannot go on like this. Even if you two perhaps do not realize it, I most certainly do. I am unwilling to utter my brother's name before this creature, and therefore will say only, we have to try to get rid of it. We have done everything humanly possible to care for it and show it tolerance. I don't think anyone would reproach us on this account. She is right a thousand times over. Gregor's father murmured under his breath. His mother, still incapable of breathing freely, began to cough dully into her lifted hand, a lunatic expression in her eyes. Gregor's sister hurried over to her mother and held her forehead. Her words seemed to have given her father an idea, for he now sat up straight. Playing with his uniform cap between the plates left behind on the table from the lodger's supper and glancing over from time to time at a quiet Gregor. We have to try to get rid of it his sister said, addressing her words exclusively to Gregor's father this time, for his mother was coughing too hard to hear anything. It'll be the death of you too.
I can see it now. When people have to work as hard as all of us have been doing, it just isn't possible to endure these endless torments at home. I cannot bear it anymore either. And she burst into sobs, weeping so forcefully that her tears flowed down upon her mother's face, from which the girl wiped them with a mechanical gesture. Child, her father said sympathetically and with noticeable compassion, but what can we do? Gregor's sister just shrugged her shoulders as a sign of the helplessness that had come over her while she was weeping, in contrast to the confidence she'd displayed a moment before. If he understood us, Gregor's father said, half questioning. His sister, still caught up in her weeping, shook one hand vehemently as a sign of how unthinkable she found this. If he understood us, his father repeated, closing his eyes to absorb her conviction that this was utterly out of the question, then it might be possible to come to an agreement with him. But as things stand, it has to go, Gregor's sister cried out, that's the only way, father. You just have to try to let go of the notion that this thing is Gregor. The real disaster is that we believe this for so long. But how could it be Gregor? If it were Gregor, it would have realized a long time ago that it just isn't possible for human beings to live beside such a creature, and it would have gone away on its own. We still would have been lacking a brother, but we would have been able to go on living and honoring his memory. But now we have this beast tormenting us. It drives away our lodgers and apparently intends to take over the entire apartment and have us sleep in the gutter. Just look, father, she suddenly shrieked, he's starting again. And in a fright that Gregor found bewildering, she now went so far as to leave her mother behind. Launching herself from her chair as if she would rather sacrifice her mother than remain in Gregor's proximity, and ran to take cover behind her father who, agitated by the way she was carrying on, rose from his own chair and half-raised his arms as if to shield her. But Gregor was far from wanting to frighten anyone, above all his sister. All he'd done was start to turn around to make his way back to his room, and admittedly this operation would have been hard not to notice. Since in his current injured state, he was obliged to use his head to help with this difficult maneuver, he kept raising it up and then thumping it against the floor. Pausing, he glanced around. His good intentions seemed to have been recognized. It had been only a momentary fright. Now all of them gazed at him sadly and in silence. His mother lay in her armchair, her extended legs pressed together, barely able to keep her eyes open in her exhaustion. His father and sister sat side by side, and his sister had draped one hand across her father's neck. Perhaps I'll be allowed to turn around now. Gregor thought and resumed his labors. He could not entirely suppress the wheezing this exertion produced, and now, and then he had to rest. Otherwise, no one was harassing him. He had been left to attend to matters on his own. When he had completed this rotation, he immediately made straight for the door to his room. He was astonished at how great a distance separated him from his destination, and he didn't understand how, weak as he was. He had been able to traverse the same distance just a little while before almost without noticing. Steadfastly concentrating only on crawling as quickly as possible, he scarcely paid any heed to the fact that not a word, not a cry came from his family to disturb him. Only when he was already in the doorway did he turn his head, not all the way around, as he felt his neck growing stiff, but even so he was able to see that all was unchanged behind him. Except that his sister had risen to her feet. The last thing he saw was a glimpse of his mother, who had now fallen entirely asleep. No sooner was he in his room again than the door was hastily pressed shut, locked, and bolted. The sudden commotion at his back gave him such a frightful start that his little legs gave way beneath him. It was his sister who had hurried thus. She had already been standing there upright and waiting, then pounced so lightfootly Gregor didn't hear her approach, and she cried out, finally, to her parents as she turned the key in the lock. And now, Gregor wondered, looking around in the dark. He soon made the discovery that he was no longer capable of moving at all. He wasn't surprised at this. On the contrary, it struck him as unnatural that he had actually until now been able to support himself on those thin little legs. As for the rest, he felt relatively at ease. Admittedly, his entire body was racked with pain, but it seemed to him as if it was gradually becoming weaker and weaker and in the end would fade away altogether. Already he could scarcely feel the rotting apple in his back, nor the inflamed area surrounding it, both now enveloped in soft dust. He thought back on his family with tenderness and love. His opinion that he must by all means disappear was possibly even more emphatic than that of his sister.
He remained in this state of empty, peaceful reflection until the clock tower struck the third hour of morning. He watched as everything began to lighten outside his window. Then his head sank all the way to the floor without volition and from his nostrils his last breath faintly streamed. When the charwoman arrived early the next morning, slamming the doors so loudly in her strength and haste, often as she'd been asked to avoid this, that sleep was out of the question anywhere in the apartment after her arrival. Her usual cursory visit to Gregor's room revealed at first nothing out of the ordinary. She thought he was lying there so motionless on purpose, feigning indignation, she considered him perfectly capable of rational thought. Since she happened to be holding the long broom in her hand, she tried tickling Gregor with it from the doorway. When even this had no effect, she grew vexed and began to poke Gregor a little. And only when she had actually shifted him from the spot where he lay with no resistance at all were her suspicions roused. When soon thereafter the facts of the matter became clear to her, she gawked in surprise, gave a low whistle. Then without further delay flung open the door of the bedroom and in a loud voice shouted into the darkness, Come have a look, it's gone and croaked, just lying there, dead as a doornail. The Samsa couple shot upright in their marital bed and first had to struggle to recover from their shock at the charwoman's conduct before they were able to grasp her words. But then her and Frau Samsa hurriedly got out of bed, one on either side, her Samsa threw the blanket about his shoulders while Frau Samsa emerged wearing only her nightdress. In this state, they entered Gregor's room. Meanwhile, the door to the living room, where Greta had been sleeping since the lodger's arrival, had opened as well. She was fully dressed, as though she had not slept at all, as even the pallor of her cheeks seemed to prove. Dead? Frau Samsa asked, looking questioningly up at the charwoman, although she herself was free to investigate and, indeed, could see how things stood even without investigation. I should say so, the charwoman said, and by way of proof, pushed Gregor's corpse quite some way to the side with her broom. Frau Samsa made a gesture as though she wanted to hold back the broom, but didn't. Well, her Samsa said, now we can thank God. He crossed himself, and the three women followed his example. Greta, who did not take her eyes off the corpse for a moment, said, just look how skinny he was. He went such a long time without eating anything at all. All the food that went into his room would come out again just as before. And indeed Gregor's body was completely flat and dry. Which hadn't really been noticeable until now when he was no longer raised up on those little legs and nothing else remained to distract the gaze. Greta, come sit with us for a bit, Frau Samsa said with a melancholy smile, and Greta, glancing back at the corpse, followed her parents into their bedroom. The charwoman shut the door and opened the window wide. Despite the early morning, the crisp air was already tempered by a certain mildness. After all, it was already the end of March. The three lodgers now emerged from their room and looked about in astonishment for their breakfast. They had been forgotten. Where's breakfast? The one in the middle asked the charwoman peevishly. But she just put a finger to her lips and then quickly, without a word, beckoned the lodgers into Gregor's room. They did as she bade them, and with their hands in the pockets of their slightly threadbare little jackets, they surrounded Gregor's corpse in the room that had meanwhile become quite bright. Then the bedroom door opened, and her Samsa appeared wearing his livery, with his wife on one arm, his daughter on the other. All three looked as if they'd been weeping. Greta kept pressing her face against her father's arm. Leave my home at once, her Samsa said, pointing at the door without letting go of the womenfolk. What do you mean? The gentleman in the middle inquired, dumbfounded, and gave a saccharine smile. The two others held their hands at their backs and kept rubbing them together uninterruptedly, as if in gleeful expectation of a fight that was certain to be decided in their favor. I mean exactly what I say, her Samsa replied, now advancing on the lodger flank by his two companions. The lodger just stood there at first, looking at the ground, as if things were just rearranging themselves in his head into a new order. So we'll be leaving, he said then, looking up at her Samsa as if this new humility that had suddenly come over him required him to petition for the approval of even this decision. Her Samsa merely nodded curtly in his direction a few times, goggle-eyed. At this, the gentleman did, in fact, make haste to stride back out to the vestibule, where his two friends had been listening attentively for some moments, their hands at rest. And now they practically hopped and skipped in their hurry to follow, as if worried her Samsa might somehow precede them into the vestibule, cutting off their line of communication with their leader. In the vestibule, all three of them took their hats from the coat rack, 
withdrew their walking sticks from the cane stand, made a silent bow, and left the apartment. Displaying what soon proved to be an utterly unfounded mistrustfulness, her Samsa stepped out onto the landing with the two women. Leaning against the banister, they watched as the three gentlemen descended the long staircase. Moving slowly but at a steady pace and disappearing on each floor at a certain bend of the stairwell only to appear again a few moments later. The farther down they went, the more the Samsa family's interest in them faded, and when a butcher's apprentice came toward and then passed them on his way up, proudly bearing his tray upon his head. Her Samsa and the women abandoned the banister, and all of them returned, seemingly relieved, to their apartment. They decided to spend the day resting, and to go out for a stroll. They had not only earned this respite from their work, but were desperately in need of it. And so they all sat down at the table and wrote three letters of excuse, her Samsa to his supervisor, Frau Samsa to her employer, and Greta to her superior. While they were writing, the charwoman came in to say she was leaving, as her morning's work was completed. The three scribes at first merely nodded without looking up, and only when the charwoman failed to go on her way did they glance up in annoyance. Well, her Samsa asked. The charwoman stood smiling in the doorway as if she had some splendid good fortune to announce to the family, but would not do so until she was properly questioned. The nearly vertical little ostrich feathers on her hat, which had annoyed her Samsa for as long as she had been in the family service, bobbed gently in all directions. So what is it you want? She was asked now by Frau Samsa, the member of the family for whom the charwoman still had the most respect. Well, the charwoman replied, her own good-natured laughter making it impossible at first for her to go on speaking. There's no need for you to go worrying about how to get rid of that mess in there. It's already taken care of. Frau Samsa and Greta bent down over their letters as if they meant to go on writing. Her Samsa, who saw that the charwoman was about to start describing everything in detail, summarily silenced her with an outstretched hand. And since she was not permitted to say what she wished, she suddenly remembered the great hurry she was in, and so with an insulted air she cried, so long, everyone, turned wildly on her heel. And with the most excruciating slamming of doors left the apartment. Tonight she'll be let go, her Samsa said, but received an answer neither from his wife nor his daughter, for the charwoman seemed to have disturbed the equanimity they had only just attained. They rose from their seats, went to the window, and remained there with their arms about each other. Her Samsa turned in his chair to look at them and observed them quietly for a little while. Then he cried out, So come here already. Let these old matters rest, and show a little consideration for me as well. At once the women obeyed, hurried over to him, caressed him, and quickly finished their letters. Then all three of them left the apartment together, something they had not done for months, and took the electric tram all the way to the open countryside at the edge of town. The car in which they sat all alone was entirely suffused with warm sunlight. Cozily leaning back in their seats, they discussed their future prospects, and on closer investigation it appeared that these prospects were not bad at all. For all three of their positions, something they had never before properly discussed, were in fact quite advantageous and above all offered promising opportunities for advancement. The greatest immediate improvement in their situation, of course, would be easily achieved by moving to a new apartment. They now wished to take a smaller and cheaper but more convenient and above all more practical flat than their current one, which had been picked out for them by Gregor. As they were conversing in this way, her and Frau Samsa were struck almost as one while observing their daughter, who was growing ever more vivacious. By the thought that despite all the torments that had made her cheeks grow pale, she had recently blossomed into a beautiful, voluptuous girl. Growing quieter now and communicating with one another almost unconsciously by an exchange of glances, they thought about how it would soon be time to find her a good husband. And when they arrived at their destination, it seemed to them almost a confirmation of their new dreams and good intentions when their daughter swiftly sprang to her feet and stretched her young body. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.